Hello, everyone. I am really excited. The last time we launched a pan-European thermal atlas version 3 was in the, if I may say so, the periphery of Europe in Edinburgh. And the audience was much smaller. And Eva Hus was there by, um, by video line from Brussels. So it's, it's an immense, tremendous pleasure, really, to be here today and, and talk about our work that has been going on um, among the universities of uh, Halmstadt, Aalborg, and Flensburg uh, over the last year or so. Um, this, uh, oh, yeah, sorry. My short agenda, we all know why we need heat atlases, so I can skip that slightly. I will show, show a short story about how the tool has developed since version one. Uh, then about the main topic, how can we localize uh, heat demand and cooling demand. I'm not so much talking about cooling demand, not at all. And then um, the supply, the possible supplies by either individual technologies, by district heating. Um, and how can we do that? Because there's no way that our advanced statistics in Europe tell us how we can decompose geographically the heat demand of Europe. Then I will show a few aspects about the online mapping that will be an introduction of the online mapping tool by, by Lars later on, and, and then an outlook. Well, why thermal atlases? Um, traditionally, the sector is very little described uh, in detail. Um, either we have very local information, and the concept of making heat atlases is not at all new. The first heat atlases were made in the 1970s. Or we have a national overview uh, on the national scale, but this does not allow us to tell how much district heating, how much energy efficiency, how much individual heating uh, makes sense. So this is not, yeah. So there's no coherent mapping of demands carried out and not of the supplies at, uh, at these scales. Heat is local, however, and heat requires explicit mapping. And that means that thermal atlases should describe um, heat demand and supply by means of geographical data. And we want these data to be as detailed as possible. The problem, however, is that the production of this data is cumbersome and is expensive. And although we talk about a large European project here, we, we would not have the money actually to go around and see what is the heat demand? What are the possibilities of supplying heat to 500 million people? So that's why we uh, use an approach that is very pra pragmatic. The word has been used to before. Um, we use few but authoritative data that are available, available in the public space to distribute all the figures that uh, Tobias has shown just before. Um, so the objectives are to map the demand to supply and the cost in a coherent way at uh, disaggregated levels to avoid the generation of what we can call data graveyards. We're not collectors, containers of large amounts of data. We use existing data and try to make sense of them, to interpret them. <coughs> we rely on open existing data rather than on data generation in the project. And we apply a general methodology for all of Europe. As I said before, there are uh, areas of Europe, for example, Scotland, which have very fine heat atlases, highly uh, developed uh, methodologies to map heat demand locally and nationally. But we don't have that across Europe. And the Stratego project has shown that the knowledge gap between the countries is, in, is very high. Some countries need a lot of help to get started with the mapping. And others can offer a product that is much better than the one that we are do going to develop here. And we trust in quantification. Um, even though that we know that the database today is weak. And this brings me to my first map. And this map is not PETA, don't worry. Uh, it has been made by the Greek uh, geographer Ptolemy in the year 150 AD. And up to the age of the great 
discoveries just before Columbus time. This was the only world map that was broadly accepted <coughs> across Europe. Because as what you can see here, if you look closely, that most of the, part, most of the, the, the world uh, is maybe there. We see Africa, we see Asia and Europe. The Americas are not there, of course. And I show this map to say that we are navigating in uncharted waters, but the absence of a map should not uh, say that we're not doing any mapping at all. So we can't wait for the data to arrive, and we have started our journey, so we need something. And this something can be an atlas that can be developed with comparably little money input. The history of PETA from version 1, 2, 3, and 4 is as follows. The first heat roadmap Europe study in 2012 described heat demand by NUTS 3 areas. There are 1,500 NUTS 3 districts approximately across Europe. So no geographical detail at all. The next study zoomed into a one square kilometer resolution of heat demand and possible supply. PETA then, PETA 3 then, as part of the Stratego project work package 2, uh, described heating and cooling demands at an analytical level of 100 meters. We only showed a one square kilometer resolution, resolution because at that time we were very little confident about the data. So what we're going to do now is to see how can we make, uh, how we can, can we increase the confidence in PETA 100, uh, 100 meter resolution, um, without telling too much. Because one of the important things to learn is that it is still a model. We're not building an accounting system for heat demand across Europe. The methodology we use is a combined bottom-up, top-down approach. We use national uh, data on end use. We've just seen that uh, in uh, Tobias' presentation. And we use small-scale sectoral analysis, uh, statistics on the NUTS 3 level. And then bottom-up, we try to describe what makes a town, what makes a heat-demanding area. So we use 100-meter resolution grid or raster representations of urban tissue, by which we then try to model single-family houses, multi-family houses, the number of square meters per hectare, the densities, and so on. And we can do that by a lot of data that has been collected by the European Commission and the European Environmental Agency. The combination happens by means of spatial statistics. Um, and that is what uh, my colleague Eva has spent about a year or so, uh, at least half a year, to develop. As there is no European data on the heat demand available uh, and cooling demand at high resolution, we need to develop a model. And the model is then based on a series of hypotheses that say that, let's say, if we have a lot of people in an area, heat demand is high in an area. If we have a lot of built up areas in, in, a, in, a, in an area, the, the heat demand must be high as well. So, we have tested these hypotheses against real data. We have very good building registers, for example, in Denmark, which we have used to train our models. And then the result is a set of multilinear um, uh, regression analysis that can be used as a model to generate, let's say, if we have soil ceiling or, or build up percentage of X percent, and we know how many people live in an area, and, and a few other things, we can um, calculate the, the heat demand in that area. And that is why it's important to see PETA as a model and not as an accounting system. Because if we zoom down to the 100 meter cell, we can never really say whether the heat demand is really 215 gigajoules or twice as high. We don't know. We want to give a representative model of how cities and uh, urban areas are composed in Europe. Because, with reference to Ptolemy's map, we don't really know what is beyond, beyond the, the, the Atlantic Ocean. So this is how it may look like. A few maps to show you. On the left-hand side, we see our data that has been aggregated by, <coughs> disaggregated by Urban uh, Persson. Um, on the right-hand side, we see some of the input data. For example, the degree of build-up. We are in Brussels, by the way, if you notice. And the population. Uh, there's a new 100-meter population raster 
uh, developed by the JRC uh, just a couple of months ago, so that came in very conveniently for us. And then we calculate the floor area. For each hectare, we calculate how many square meters of floor area do we have for multi-story buildings, for single-family houses, for the service sector. And that is, that is something quite new. That is actually an innovation in this, uh, in this tool. We had it in PETA 3, but only for the service sector. And then the resulting map is a, a heat demand, uh, the current heat demand, the future heat demand based on 100 meter resolution. So <clears throat> this is how it may look. Um, the product, one of the products, this is actually a picture a screenshot from the online mapping tool that, that Lars is going to present in a few minutes. Uh, we have decided to uh, characterize, to, to, to classify with, with a few classes that we have adopted from the Danish Energy Agency as something that uses simple colors to say whether district heating makes no sense at all, good sense, or is really a good idea. It depends on the policies, it depends on the planning. Heat demand is modeled for each one hectare cell across Europe, and you can imagine that is a large amount of data. And much of the time is actually about handling data. Um, density classification gives a first overview. You can look at a map and see whether this district heating may be a good idea or not. And then demands can be summarized by, for example, prospective district heating areas. So here, I want to show you a comparison between our previous heat atlas version 3. On the left-hand side, we see an area halfway. This is part of the rural district in Germany, and then we have uh, the neighborhood. In PETA 3, um, we see a, a coarser image of urban tissues, of the urban uh, structures. And that has been improved greatly in version 4. It, version 4 offers a finer grain a better confidence, and the mapping is smoother. And we believe that is uh, also giving advantages for the accuracy of such a tool. If we zoom in to this area, we can see um, how the grain improves, how we now are able to say, this is city area, this is maybe a motorway, or a green area, or a lake, and we don't really have heat demand in those areas. It also gives us a good idea on how to find, um, identify smaller areas that all can form district heating sub uh, systems. Um, we work with something that we call prospective supply areas. Um, we're still looking for a better word. But these areas are adopted from the European Environmental Agency, um, the, the urban morphological zones. That's an even uh, better term, I think. Uh, these shows city areas that are coherent and connected. And there are around 113,000 of them in the 14 Pitta countries. What we want to do is for each of those areas to give a cost curve, <coughs> the availability of renewable energy, uh, the possibility of doing district heating and so on. Uh, then about the online mapping, uh, we have made experiences with online mapping uh, as part of the PETA uh, 3 uh, experience. Um, we've seen that um, we need to rely that the system has to work even though many people are logging onto it, as we will see in a few minutes. Um, we uh, have the big challenge of addressing both specialists in mapping, specialists in energy, but also a lot of laymen. A lot of politicians and lobby workers, so all of them should really make sense of our tool, understand it, and be able to use it. We're not going to do a specialized tool. Um, we chose uh, ArcGIS.com by the Environmental Systems Research Institute, which is probably the largest commercial vendor of GIS software. And so far, it has been uh, performing well. well. One of the reasons is actually cost, because we are using a campus license uh, a public license, uh, and because we don't need to develop a lot, uh, this can be done for a low budget as well. What we're going to show today is basically heat demand today, or 2015, and how the heat demand can be 
characterized. We know the excess heat uh, producing facilities, and we have a few other things in the pipeline. But some of the highlights of the next project meeting will probably be cooling demands, the future heat demands in areas, uh, in, 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 in urban and uh, non-urban areas, the distribution network costs for district heating and cooling, and also the allocation of excess heat demand, for example, to the existing systems. We've seen from David's slides that in Middlesbrough, there's a lot of excess heat. But what happens if excess heat only forms a small share, or if excess heat has to be shared in a competition between different district heating systems. We try to find answers for that in an allocation. Um, and also we want to make the map more, more readable. So that is basically what I wanted to say to this and then uh, hope that my colleagues will supplement a little more. Yes, hello. My name is Urban Pashon and I'm very glad to be here see so many people here today and uh, I will uh, talk a little bit today about the data that we are using in terms of resource atlases. We've heard about the demand atlases now and uh, uh, the data that goes into them. Uh, I would also like to say that uh, I know you've all been waiting for maps and I tell you they, they are right about to be served to you now, because this presentation is more or less maps, all of them. And also, they are static maps. And I must remind you and myself that when we started Heat Roadmap Europe back in 2012, there was no web map service involved. We made static PDF maps or we, that we presented in reports. And we will still continue to do that also now in our dissemination and report writing. But of course, the main theme and the real great thing today is the launch of the, of the public web service. Uh -huh. So uh, in terms of resource atlases, uh, there are three uh, basic categories so far that I've been working with. It's the district heating systems, which are the core resource, you could say, uh, for this to happen. It's the excess heat sources, resources, that I will mention and show you a little bit about the sources we have used. And of course, the renewable heat resources, which is the purpose to, to, to integrate here. And one could start with the thinking about what is really the definition of a district heating system. And I've searched a lot for that. You know, there are systems that in include maybe a couple of blocks or a few hundred apartments. And you could talk about a district heating system being the whole city of Stockholm or Copenhagen, for example, what is a district heating system? And the best uh, definition I've found so far is that it's, it's got to be more than one building owner. <laughs> so, and we've already seen also today that in Europe, district heating uh, on, on the, you could say, now this is residential, about around 10 to 12 percent of the final consumption, energy final consumption, is district heating. And I, I know it was mentioned by Eva and we also heard that uh, the heating and cooling sectors represent about 50% of the total final consumption. I just want to have a remark here. I think it would be very, very nice soon to, have, to see some changes in these static numbers because it's starting to be a little bit enervating. Anyway, and the reason why I say it is because already back in, two, in 2012, I don't know, we found that there could be actually a directly feasible threefold expansion from current levels of district heating in European cities. And this is why we expect it to be a feasible expansion void and, uh, in these studies that we do. Um, so district heating systems. In Halmstad University, we have spent time since 2010 in building a dedicated European database on uh, the district heating system. We, we think there are like 6,000 in Europe today, and we have around 4,500 here in this database, which includes uh, geographical coordinates for the city center. These are point sources. So we know that there are heating, district heating systems the, at these locations, in these cities. We know also the amount of heat sold or coal sold for these systems. Uh, not for all of them, but we, have, we try to gather these data and the length of the, the total trend length of the system. 
And we worked with the third update now last year, meaning that we have records of about 4,700 4, European district heating systems. About data availability, we have a Q value, or the heat sold, annual sold heat value, for about 66% of them. And in this project, the first real challenge has been we need to transpose or convert these point sources to some area entity, polygons, when we talk map language. And for this reason, we have used also the coherent urban tissue or the urban morphological zones, the UM sets, uh, which are defined as uh, land cover classes from the, ur from the Korean land cover database that contribute to the urban tissue. In this, in, included in the urban morphological zones are the four categories, continuous urban fabric, discontinuous urban fabric, industrial and commercial units, and green urban areas. And these are represented here, although the, the resolution is so high here, so it doesn't make much sense. But I will show more explicit case studies you know, close up later. Anyway, Bernd mentioned there was like 113,000 for the 14 member states in Heat World Map Europe 4. There's over 130,000 UM sets in all of Europe. And the Korean land cover database counts 44 land use classes. In our uh, conversion here, oh, sorry. We have uh, established around 3,300, 280 UM sets with at least one district heating system. So in this, in this conversion, we are now talking about, or we are looking at uh, UM sets with at least one or two district heating systems. And this layer is, on, is included in the online, online map that we will see later. As a case up study, I can just show you uh, the area around Brussels here. These are first all of the UM sets around this area. Here are district heating systems from the database with names. And here's the conversion. So these are the UM sets with at least one district heating system in this area here. And for these areas, we have summed up uh, a lot of different stats. For example, the amount, the, the total amount of uh, district heating uh, uh, heat sold close to one exajoule, and the population close to 180 million is inhabiting these uh, DHUM sets, as we call them. Uh, just to mention it, what we really aim for here is, is uh, the absolute closest fit we can get to, you could say, coherent polygons of high heat demand density areas. So the UM sets are a first could say assessment, we would like to come even closer. And this is from the uh, PETA 3, heat demand, PETA 2, heat demand density layer, and this is actually the one you can see now. So we are aiming to associate district heating systems eventually to the high, real high density areas, to have a real nice close fit uh, for this. Well, in terms of excess heat sources, uh, the first of them or the only one of them I could say so far that we have really been able to use is something called the EPRTR database. I don't know, have any, anybody heard about that? It's a public European emissions database. It's the largest piece of data on uh, economic activities in Europe that are emitting some kind of uh, uh, substance to either land, water, or air. And the fine thing about this database, it's apart from being public, it's that it got geographical coordinates uh, on all plants. I have, just to mention it, been looking to, tr to try to find data from the EU ETS system. But it's not public. Geographical coordinates are not public for those uh, systems. Uh, and if they were able, sometimes also they, they are not recording them for the plants, but for the owning companies. So. Uh, this is a very, very useful database. Also, the carbon dioxide emissions are used through a reverse calculation sequence to, to calculate the excess heat and the primary energy input to these, each of these plants. Uh, we are also looking here to link these uh, excess heat activities to the DHUM sets that I mentioned. Just some basic data here. We can see that there, there's about 32, 33,000 unique facilities in the European emissions database. And those emitting to air 
carbon dioxide uh, reported, carbon dioxide air emissions, there are about 2,200 of them in Europe. These are large-scale plants, by the way, above thermal power plants above 50 megawatts. And if we look at them, maybe some of you recognize this map. It was part of the, of the PETA-3 as well. We've done it before. Uh, these are the plants. Uh, with CO2 air, we have to do, a, a, we do a, a, ch uh, a selection, you could say, from different years, mainly from 2014, and adding some plants from these years to have a, 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 a balance with the cross-checking of total uh, international energy agency statistics to, to match the estimated primary energy volume to statistics so that we have a, an estimate of, of the amount of plants being in operation. And now for the online map, we have reduced the amount of categories that you saw there. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we used main sector categories here. We are now showing these on the online map by th simply three. It's either industrial, it's excess heat, it's uh, uh, waste to energy, uh, excess heat sources. And together, uh, altogether, I think there is about... 2,189 large-scale excess heat activities for the 14 heat roadmap Europe uh, member states. And the total primary energy volume to these is around 20 exajoules, and the total excess heat volume is about 8.7 exajoules. But I need to remind you all that we are not including nuclear uh, power plants in this assessment, which we often get questions about. What the reason, there is really no reason other than the, there's a low traditional historical interest to utilize this kind of source, but this might change in the future. And there is indication of interest. In 2010, the primary input to European uh, uh, nuclear power plants was around 10 exajoules. And with an average conversion efficiency of about 33% for the production of electricity. That means there, there's some, somewhere about 6.7 exajoules of excess heat in European power, uh, nuclear power plants, just to mention it, which is not included here. I might also add that, like I mentioned, for the EU ETS, there are a lot of smaller plants in Europe, smaller uh, heat plants and stuff, which is not included in this. So this is a conservative estimate of the excess heat uh, availability, I would say. So we can also see that there are some, of course, countries here, Germany, uh, UK, Poland, Italy, that really are dominating in terms of excess heat from fuel combustion activities. One could say France should be expecting maybe more, but you have a lot of electricity from nuclear in France. Maybe that's why they're so low in, in the total excess heat volume here. And then, of course, the linkage to the UM sets, DHUM sets, we have... I've done a study to see how many of these excess heat activities are inside these DHUM sets, how many are within a 20 kilometer distance, and how many are not in range. And uh, once again, back to the Brussels area example, we have found here that the largest volumes are inside, and in terms of counts, 383 not, not, uh, UM sets have excess heat activities inside. And you might remember this number here, because I'm going to show you at the end uh, uh, assessment for the solar thermal potential, which is based on all the ones that does not have excess heat. Another thing when it comes to excess heat, just to mention it, is, is uh, the issue is, are they going to be there in the future? Because recovering excess heat is not, it involves some kind of, you could say, dimensions that are not there if you, in terms of utilizing fuel directly. These are commercial activities that have another primary objective than generating excess heat. They are producing something. And the excess heat is available as long as the, the factory or the company are, are in operation. So I just you can just look at the stats here and see that, for example, if we look at waste to energy plants and thermal power generation plants or thermal power stations, we see two different uh, you say development trends. We have more and more waste to energy facilities uh, generating electricity. We have fewer uh, power stations uh, in Europe. And these trends are something that we are considering also for the future scenarios. Uh, for some, some, just some brief looks at the data we use for renewable heat resources. Uh, first of all, I have combined into the Hounslow University District Heating Cooling Database some of the uh, 
systems that already today utilize either geothermal, solar thermal, or bioenergy. Uh, uh, but we know, for example, for biomass that there is much more biomass being used, so we try to assess that. One way to do that is actually through the EPRTR, where we have about 420 plants that are apparently co-firing biomass. And they are reporting, uh, oh, I'm sorry, they are reports uh, from 322 plants uh, con corresponding to a, a primary energy biomass volume of about 700 petajoules in roughly, and you can see these plants here. We have also some other sources, TU, University, Technical University of Vienna, published some data for Austria, biomass use, and BSA and so forth. So we are looking at trying to establish more knowledge about where the biomass is and can be used. There's also the BioBoost project, just want to mention it, from 2013, which looked at the residual biomass potential. Uh, with the objective of, of a sustainable uh, use of biomass. And we can see that uh, the, the main, the biggest uh, contributor here is straw and forest, uh, biodegradable municipal waste and pruning, which dominate, you, you could say, a total potential of 4.1 exajoules per year in biomass residuals. Uh, geothermal, we all have probably heard about the GUDH project from 2012, counting about 180 facilities uh, utilizing uh, deep geothermal energy. And this is a huge potential here. We have recognized that also in the heat roadmap, previous heat roadmap Europe studies. Now we're looking closer into the reservoirs that are actually available here. Here's some, our uh, hot sedimentary. We can see temperature levels here by 90 degrees, by 50 degrees. Uh, this is just to illustrate the vast potential here. We also know from previous studies that 25% of EU's population lives in areas directly suitable for geothermal district heating. Uh, and we are considering in this study to express the geothermal potential as a property of the UM set, the district heating UM sets, just to mention that. Finally, just to finish off here, I just want to show we are also working with an assessment of the potential for solar thermal. We know today that there's one, about one square kilometer in all of Europe in terms of uh, collector fields for solar, large scale solar thermal, one square kilometer. Uh, we have tried, and this we have from the solar district heating uh, project, which has been going on for many years. Uh, dominated, Denmark is dominating this development uh, uh, completely, you could say. Uh, if we, as we have done here, go back to the Brussels area and we look at all the UM sets and we say all the ones that have excess heat, we take them out. All the ones that have waste energy, we take them out. But they, they already have a, a very fine alternative for heat supply. We also take out the ones that have biomass in terms of what we know. That leaves us with 2,482 candidate UM sets that could qualify for solar thermal potential assessment. <coughs> and we have done this assessment. We can go into another close up here to, to close this. Kempen and Tönniswurst in Germany, you can see those two candidate UM sets here. What we've done is that we have calculated a one kilometer, I'm sorry, a one kilometer buffer around these. And that buffer has been the select, selecting premise for the land use classes. Once again, back to the Korean land use cover classes, where we have picked out seven classes that are suitable land for collector fields. And we have done this uh, overlay analysis, and we have found that, uh, I'll end this like this, we have found, to put it short, that suitable land within these buffers constitute 56%. The land area uh, needed is 200 times the required, uh, um, 200 times the required is available. And if we were to have 20% solar district heating in these UM sets, we would have 90 times the current uh, collector field area. So that's something about that potential. We are just starting with this work and we hope to refine this further, of course. So that's one of the first things we, we look now uh, in, in the spring here. We will also work, like Ben said, on regional heat balances, the allocation of lo location of resource to demands. 
and uh, further versions of PETA 4. But of course, now it's uh, time to concentrate on the first version of the PETA 4. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll be giving uh, my presentation a bit differently. I'll be sitting down so I'm able to actually work with the tool while I'm presenting it. Um, first off, I maybe should mention it's a bit funny that I'm the one presenting this tool since I've actually not been directly involved in the development of the PETA 4. But I think it also sh shows some of the very important aspects, which is that I can actually work with this tool even though I didn't develop it. <laughs> <laughs> that part is mainly to, uh, due to band and urban and even fence as well. This is the welcoming screen, so let's click it and have a look at the tool itself. The tool, as it's been mentioned several times, is showing the heat the demand potential in 14 of the uh, European member uh, states, and this is roughly 90% of the total heat demand available. The mapping tool consists of several layers, so if we zoom in a little bit, we'll actually be able to see these ones popping up over here in the legend to the left. I can see you don't have the full part of it, but we have four layers available to the left side here that turn black once they are activated. These four layers are the excess heat activities that Urban was describing just before. There are these closer. Yeah, can you hear me all now? They are the co coherent urban areas, as Urban was describing just before as well. They are ex in two different variations. The first one is the ur urban areas which has one or more district heating systems uh, in the existing, uh, uh, already uh, existing. And the second one is all the urban zones, but with a uh, sum of the heat demand within each one of them. And finally, we have the heat demand density, which is this 100 by 100 square meter uh, resolution. So if we start off with that one, we can zoom into, for example, Paris and have a look at how will uh, the heat demand density look in a city area within Europe. And I don't know how the colors are for you up there. We can adjust them a little bit. That's a nice feature. You're able to change the transparency. It can also be useful if you are actually wanting to print out a map of this one, then you can change the transparency so you can see it a bit better. Basically, you're able to see that within the center of the city, you have this very high heat demand. I'll put the legend available as well. This is the purple areas, which represent a heat demand of more than 300 teradoules per square kilometer. If we go more out towards the suburban areas, you see that the heat demand is slowly declining into the orange area with 100 to 300 terawatt, uh, teradoules per square kilometer, and further out, maybe only 50 to 120 teradoules per square kilometer. And just to put these numbers a bit into perspective, in a Danish case, you would say that 300 teradoules would be a definite place to go for district heating, where you'll be almost 100% guaranteed to have a feasible investment by doing district heating. And in Denmark in general, you also look at any area with above 120 teradoules as a very high potential for district heating. And if we look at the development of district heating in the later years, you also see that in many areas of maybe only 50 or a bit more teradoules per square kilometer, we already have operational district heating in the Danish case by now. So this is how you can see the heat demand density for all across Europe. And this is just one example of one city. After this presentation, all of you are able to go out and look into your own areas. Another example of how you can work with the tool is if we look at the area of Middlesbrough and Newcastle. So Middlesbrough is the area David was pointing at before also, where we can see the heat demand density here. And then I'll activate two further layers. The first one is the one indicating the total heat demand of Middlesbrough. So as you can see, there's now an overlay here. And if I click it, I'm able to get up this kind of a table, where there's a sum of all the heat demands within the urban area of Middlesbrough. You can see that it's distributed depending on the amount of heating, so you can say the, the density of the heat demand, but a sum of all of these is roughly uh, eight petajoules. The next step to look at is then, what kind of excess heat demand do we have available in this area? So if we activate these plants, we can see that as Urban was describing, they are divided into three different categories, the industrial uh, excess heat, co-generation excess heat, and waste to energy 
exocete. The second thing we can see when we look at these points is the size of the circle is indicating the amount of excess heat available. So an obvious thing to start with is always to look at the biggest circle close to where you are uh, investigating the potential of this to heating. In this case, it's an industrial excess heat facility where the theoretical excess heat available is approximately 18 petajoules. It is, of course, uh, important to mention this is the theoretical potential, so there is no guarantee that we can actually harvest all of this potential excess energy, but at least it gives an indication of how much excess energy do we actually have available in this area. If we sum all of the excess energy within these plants close to Middlesbrough, we could see, as David mentioned already, that we have more than 30 petajoules of excess heat available. And by knowing that, as well as a total heat demand of 8 petajoules, we can already start to consider this as maybe a likely place for implementing district heating. The next step, and this is always an important thing when you look at district heating, is to cross the distance between your excess heat facilities and your heat demands. And this is also possible to investigate with a tool. You can open up here to your left, there's a number of toolboxes. One of them is a meter, so you can measure distances. And what we can do with this is, for example, measure the distance from the plant we're looking at out to the outskirts of the city or just to the city center. And we can see to the center there's a distance of roughly six kilometers, and to the outskirts there's a distance of 13 and a half, 14 kilometers. And this is a distance that is very reasonable for district heating to cover when you consider the transmission of heat. Another option would be to just start from the city center and then look at how far away or how far do we need to go to find excess heat available. And we'll be able to see here that it's within a distance of roughly seven kilometers from the city center. We're able to reach not only all the heat demands, but also all the excess heat potentials. So this is already a good indication that Middlesbrough could be, for example, a potential area to look at an investigation of the feasibility of district heating. If we want to go a step further, then I'll start with going a bit away from the UK case and go to Sweden, which is a place where district heating has been in operation for many years by now. And let's just make sure that you can see all of it, yes. If we look at this area, we have the, the town of Helsingborg, which is, was developed as an individual independent district heating system. We have the town of Landskrona, which was developed in the same way. And we have the town of Lund, which was also developed in the same way. But what has happened now is that these three district heating systems has been connected with one transmission pipe in order to facilitate a better usage of the renewable energy resources in the area. What we can then do with the tool is to look at what kind of a distance are we actually talking about with this pipe. And what we can see is when we implement a pipe between these cities, and this is just a straight line as the crow flies pipe, well, is of course a bit different, it has to match the landscape, but we have to go a distance of roughly 50 kilometers. So this indicates how far are we already today able to go with this to heating when we want to, to install it. Now, if we then go back to our case from the UK and look at Middlesbrough, a very interesting thing there is that somewhat north of Middlesbrough, there's a city called Newcastle. And I would just need that map to update a little bit here. Um, when we look at looked at Newcastle, uh, Middlesbrough before, we could see there was more excess heat demand available than we actually needed for the area. But when we look north, we see Newcastle, which is a bigger city center. It's a bigger area. And if we click the map, we can also see that it has a higher demand, roughly 22 petajoules. But on the other hand, there's not a lot of excess heat available right next to it. There is one factory up here, which delivers around 20 petajoules. But other than that, there's not a lot available in the near proximity. But knowing what we know from Sweden already, we can consider that not in a short time perspective, but maybe in a long time perspective, it will actually be possible to make one district heating system for this region, which could start, for example, from the city center of Middlesbrough, go through Hartlepool, and arrive up here in Newcastle at a distance of roughly 55 kilometers. And within this distance, we'll also be able to find a lot of excess heat demand or excess heat available. We have all the 30 petajoules down here from Middlesbrough. And if we also link it a bit up to the north of Newcastle, we have 20 petatools available on top of that. So that means that within this area, we're actually able to supply all the heat demand almost entirely on excess heat. Of course, disregarding the, the temporal differences that might occur from the production and the heat demand uh, when you look at the time over the year. But at least it indicates that there's a very big potential of using excess heat to supply the heat demand in an area like this. 
and that will enable us to get rid of some of all the natural gas we use in the area. Another use case you can look at when you look at a map like this is if we zoom into the rural area that was mentioned already in some of the presentations as well. What we see here is that, first of all, there's a very big um, amount of heat demand relatively close to each other. I'll just see if I can switch this in. But furthermore, you also see that there are some very, very big facilities, facilitators of excess heat. Um, and there are two power plants, especially located just next to each other, the one here a bit north of the other. The first one has an excess heat potential of 180 petajoules, which is a really, really large amount of excess heat available, which is currently not being used. And just a little bit south, there's another power plant which has an excess heat potential of 150 petajoules. We did a small calculation just on this amount of heat. If you are able to sell that at a, what you would consider a reasonable price, in, for example, a Danish case, this heat represents a value of roughly 1 billion euros per year. That's currently and is each year, and currently it's not being used. Um, so what you can look at from the tool again, you can take your measurement tool and you can look at the distance from these plants to all the urban factors, uh, all the urban zones in the area, and see that even within a, a distance of 50 to 60 kilometers, you have a lot of heat demand that you can potentially cover with some of these excess heat. Another option, of course, would be to go even further and look at it towards the, for example, the even bigger cities in the area. So you go from these plants all the way to Brussels. This is, of course, quite crazy to think of a distance that far. It's 160 kilometers. But the cost of making a pipe like this would be roughly 200 million euros. So it would be paid back in a few months if you were actually able to transfer that amount of heat in, that, in a reasonable way. I'm not saying we should go that way. But what the modeling guys in this project might be able to say is that we should go away from these kind of very, very big power plants concentrated in one area and go towards a more distributed power generation where we also are able to use the heat generation in the urban zones next to it. So that was a few examples of how you can use the model and how you can use the, the tool online. And now it's basically up to all of you to go out home and try it, send it out to everyone you know and let them try for their local area and see where we can implement some district heating. Thank you.